the book of Isaiah, chapters 12 and 13. And happy Thanksgiving, brothers and sisters. The Lord is my strength and my song. Verse 1. At that time you will say, I will praise you, Lord, for although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you have comforted me. Look, God, yes, God, is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. You will draw water joyfully from the wells of salvation, and you will say at that time, Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his actions among the nations. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord because he has acted gloriously, being made known in all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, you who live in Zion, because great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Chapter 13, The Judgment of Babylon A message that Amos' son Isaiah received about Babylon. Raise a banner on a bare hilltop, cry out loud to them, give a wave of the hand, signaling them to enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones. I have also summoned my warriors, those who reject in my triumph, to carry out my angry judgments. Listen, there's a noise on the mountains, like that of a great multitude. Listen, there's an uproar among the kingdoms, like that of nations massing together. The Lord of the heavenly armies is mustering an army for battle. They're coming from a faraway land, from the distant horizon, the Lord and the weapons of his anger to destroy the entire land. Wail out loud, because the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, every hand will go limp. Every man's courage will melt. They will be terrified. Pain and anguish will seize them. They'll writhe like a woman in labor. They'll look aghast at one another, and their faces will be ablaze with fear. Watch out, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to turn the entire inhabited earth into a desolation and to annihilate the sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations won't shine their light. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon won't shine its light. I'll punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I'll put an end to the pomposity of the arrogant and overthrow the insolence of tyrants. I'll make people scarcer than pure gold and mankind rarer than gold from Ophir. Therefore I'll make the heavens tremble. The earth, the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord of the heavenly armies at the time of his burning anger. They will be hunted. They will be like a hunted gazelle, or like sheep with no one to gather them. Each will turn to his own people, and each will flee to his own land. Whoever is captured will be thrust through, and whoever is caught will fall dead, killed by the sword. Their infants will be dashed to pieces before their eyes, and their houses will be looted, and their wives slept with. Watch out! I'm stirring up the maids against them, who care for nothing for silver and take no delight in gold. Their bows will dash the young men to pieces. They'll show no pity on those not yet born, and their eyes will not spare children. Babylon, that jewel of kingdoms, the splendor and pride of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in through all generations. No Bedouin will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks lie down there. But desert beasts will lie down there, and their houses will be full of howling creatures. There owls will dwell, and goat demons will dance there. Hyenas will howl in its strongholds, and jackals will make their tents in citadels. Its time is close at hand, and its days will not be extended any further. Blessed be the word of the Lord. Praise his holy name. That's a pretty terrifying chapter.
So let's just jump right in. Since these are such short chapters, we're just going to hit 12 and 13 at the same time. We'll just go through and we'll do the NIV commentary first, Matthew Henry and Wycliffe last. So let's get started here. The Hymns of Deliverance in that day, i.e. the time of salvation, introduces both of these two songs of praise. The appropriate response to God's saving work is always song. Verses 1 through 3, the song includes one of the key themes of chapters 40 through 55. God's unmerited grace motivates people to trust Him. He satisfies His own anger and instead of berating His suffering people, He encourages or comforted them. Instead of being the one who condemns, He becomes a strength and a defense. Chapter 7 through 12 begin with a refusal to trust and an end with a declaration of trust. Chapter 12 verse 1, I will praise you. The prophet speaks for the nation, praising God for his deliverance. 4 through 6, the second song includes one of the key themes of chapters 56 through 66, to make known among the nations what God has done. Verse 4, God's saving name. Verse for must be declared to all the world. And chapter 13, Lessons in Trust. Ahaz, representative of his people, trusted humanity's glory rather than Jehovah's faithfulness. So this section shows that Jehovah can be trusted and trusting humanity is folly. It begins with prophecies against the nations continues with a more general statement of God's sovereignty in the world, moves to a series of woes against those who trust Egypt rather than Yahweh, and graphically pictures the contrasting results of the two trusts, a desert or a garden. 13.1 through 23.18 are prophecies against the nations. It's a collection of such prophecies also appear in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and their placement in each book reflects that particular thought structure of that book. Here, they de demonstrate the folly of trusting such nations since they are all under the judgment from Israel's God. It is difficult to determine any intentional organization of the prophecies except they begin and conclude with the great political and military power on the east and the commercial power on the west. Possibly this inclusion in this inclusio representing the two gods of human security suggests that all the nations of the earth are intended. Judah's inclusion in the collection shows that even though they were the people of God, he would treat them no differently if they acted like the other nations. Thirteen one through fourteen twenty seven Babylon and briefly Assyria. Although Assyria was the great power of Isaiah's day, Babylon was always the center of glory and sophistication. That great city was always restive under Assyria's control and always seeking allies. In its effort to shake off that control, finally, of course, it would be Babylon, not Assyria, that would bring Judah down. For all these reasons, it is appropriate that Isaiah should begin his discussion of the folly of trusting all human glory with the treatment of Babylon. That treatment takes three parts, a prophecy against Babylon itself, a prophecy against the king of Babylon, and a prophecy against Assyria. While this prophecy explicitly addresses Babylon, much of the language is universally suggesting that Babylon represents the world. This is likely since a later prophecy is more specific concerning historical Babylon. In 13.1, Isaiah understands that Babylon, not Assyria, is the ultimate threat to Judah. God inspires him to predict that future. In verse 2, the word banner. In verse 3, those I prepared for battle, or my consecrated ones, perhaps a reference to the Medes and Persians who would bring Babylon down. Verses 4 through 5, kingdoms, nations, faraway lands, end of the heavens, the whole country, universal language for the whole earth. And verse 6, the day of the Lord. Not a 24-hour day, but a period of time when God would take direct action. 
See references also in Joel 115, Amos 520, Zephaniah 17. Many of the Israelites believe that since they were God's chosen people, that time would necessarily be one of the blessings. The prophet declared that it could just as well be a time of judgment as here a people, including God's people, were living in disobedience. Verse 11, Arrogance and Pride, one of the recurring issues of the part of the book. Earth is full of glory of Yahweh, not the glory of humanity. In verse 6, a picture of total war as practiced in the ancient world. Verses 17 through 14, 2, this seems to speak more specifically of the fall of the city of Babylon and the consequent return of the Jews from exile. In verse 17, the Medes, a warlike people from Zagros Mountains, east of Babylon. Initially, they teamed up with Babylon to destroy Assyria. Then they turned against Babylon and helped Persia wipe out the Babylonian Empire. Darius the Mede, as in Daniel 5.31. Nevertheless, although the Medes were an instrument, the, the instrument, God brought Babylon down. And verse 20, she will never be inhabited. A shocking statement about one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. But that is exactly what happened. By the end of the Roman Empire, the city of Babylon was almost forgotten. And by the time of the Muslim conquest, even its location was totally lost. Verses 21 through 22, jackals, owls, hyenas, unclean animals living in wasteland. In Revelation 18, 2, impure spirits and unclean birds and animals inhabit the fallen Babylon. I just want to add to that um, before I go into the Matthew Henry um, that it not be lost of the two things that we hear in 1321 well just let me read the whole 21 but desert beasts will lie down there and their houses will be full of howling creatures there owls will dwell and demons will dance there that is, that is scary. Um, yeah, I'm not going to add to that. I'll just leave it as is. That's a separate video of that discussion, so I'll just leave that there. Let's jump into the Matthew Henry, chapter 12. Every believer shall sing a song of praise, and many in concert shall join in praising God. This is a hymn of praise suited to the times of the Messiah. The song of praise in this chapter I had to scroll out a little bit so I could read everything here. This is a hymn of praise suited to the times of the Messiah. The song of praise in this chapter is suitable for the return of the outcasts of Israel from their long captivity, but it is especially suitable to the case of a sinner when he first finds peace and joy in believing, to that of a believer when his peace is renewed after corrections for backsliding, and to that of the whole company of the redeemed when they meet before the throne of God in heaven. The promise is sure, and the blessings contained in it are very rich, and the benefits enjoyed through Jesus Christ call for the most enlarged thanksgivings. By Jesus Christ, the root of Jesse, the divine anger against mankind was turned away, for he is our peace. Those to whom God is reconciled, he comforts. They are taught to triumph in God and their interest in him. I will trust him to prepare me for salvation and preserve me to it. I will trust him with all my concerns, not doubting, but that he will make all to work for good. Faith in God is a sovereign remedy against tormenting fear. Many Christians have God for their strength, who have him not for their song. They walk in darkness. But those who have God for their strength ought to make him their song, that is, give him glory of it, and to take themselves the comfort of it. This salvation is from the love of God the Father. It comes to us through God the Son. It is applied by the new creating power of God the Spirit. When this is seen by faith, the trembling sinner learns to hope in God and is delivered from fear. The purifying and sanctifying influences of the Holy Ghost often are denoted under the emblem of springing water. This water flows through the mediation of Christ and is conveyed to our souls by means of God's ordinances. 
Blessed be God, we have wells of salvation opened on every side and may draw from the waters of life and consolation. In the second part of this gospel song, in verses 4 through 6, believers encourage one another to praise God and seek to draw others to join them in it. No difference of opinions about the times and seasons and other such matters ought to divide the hearts of Christians. Let it be our care that we may be placed among those who, whom he will say, Come, ye blessed of my Father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. In Matthew Henry chapter 13, split into three parts, a general rendezvous of the forces employed against Babylon, to the bloody work those forces should make in Babylon, and three, the utter ruin and desolation of Babylon. The armies of God's wrath, 1 through 5, the conquest of Babylon, 6 through 18, its final des desolation, 19 through 22. In verses 1 through 5, the threatenings of God's word press heavily upon the wicked and are, and are a sore burden, too heavy for them to bear. The persons brought together to lay Babylon waste are called God's sanctified or appointed ones, designated for the server service and made able to do it. They are called God's mighty ones because they had their might from God and were now to use it for him. They come from afar. God can make those a scourge and ruin to his enemies who are farthest off and therefore least dreaded. 6 through 18, we have here the terrible desolation of Babylon by the Medes and Persians. Those who in the day of their peace were proud, haughty, terrible, and quite dispirited, dispirited when troubled comes. Their faces shall be scorched with the flame. All comfort and hope shall fail. The stars of heaven shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened. Such, such expressions are often employed by the prophets to describe the convulsions of governments. God will visit them for their iniquity, particularly the sin of pride, which brings men low. There shall be a general scene of horror. Those who join themselves to Babylon must expect to share her plagues. Revelation 18.4 all that men have, they would give it for their lives, but no man's riches shall be the ransom of his life. Pause here and wonder that men should be thus cruel and inhuman, and see how corrupt the nature of man is become. And that little infants thus suffer, which shows that there is an original guilt by which life is forfeited as soon as it has begun. The day of the Lord will indeed be terrible with wrath and fierce anger, far beyond all here stated. Nor will there be any place for the sinner to flee to, or attempt an escape. But few act as though they believed these things. In 19 through 22, Babylon was a noble city, yet it should be wholly destroyed. None shall dwell there. It will be a haunt for wild beasts. All this is fulfilled. The fate of this proud city is proof that the truth of the Bible and the emblem of the approaching ruin of the New Testament Babylon, a warning to sinners to flee from the wrath to come, and it encourages believers to expect victory over every enemy of their souls and the church of God. The whole world changes and is liable to decay. Wherefore, let us give diligence to obtain a kingdom which cannot be moved, and in this hope, let us hold fast that grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Amen to that. And that is the end of the Matthew Henry. Let's move over to the Wyclef. Thanksgiving and triumph of Christ's redeem in 1 through 6. Here we have a beautiful paean of praise expressing the joy of a people completely yielded to God's will and discipline and completely content with his grace. This song of the millennial believers furnishes assurance that despite the hindrances presented by the disobedient and backsliding ones of the chosen race, God's perfect plan for that race will be completely realized at the end of human history. Volume 3, Burdens of the Judgment Upon the Gentile Nations, 13.1 through 23.18.
uh, burden, fall of Babylon, here king's descent into Hades. The downfall of Babylon, 13, 1 through 22, burden. In Hebrew, that's Massah. It's also rendered oracle, as if it signified a mere lifting up of the voice of the prophet, coming from Nasa, lift up. But judging by its usage, it seems better to understand it as that which is lifted up, a burden, that is, a burden of divine judgment, which is an offender must bear. Two nobles, the chief men of the Babylonians, three the Persians under Cyrus the Great are prophetically called God's consecrated ones because he ordained them to overthrow Babylon. Note that they were to come from a far country, verse 5, rather than from some neighboring region. Persia lay well to the east of Elam, over 350 miles from Babylon. 6. Here the day of Jehovah is clearly not eschatological, but refers to the events of 539 BC. Yet this fall of Babylon is prophetically typical of the overthrow of Latter-day Babylon, Revelation 14.8, to which the fearful meteoric phenomena of 13.10 more particularly apply. See reference Matthew 24.29, and we should all know those verses by now. This is brought out by the reference to the world in Hebrew Tabel in 1311 rather than the Chaldean Empire alone. But verses 14 through 16 certainly apply to 539 BC for the mention of Medes in verse 17 makes this clear. Medes being a name more familiar in Isaiah's day than Persians who were then still unknown to the Western Asiatics. 19 through 22 in these verses the Lord very definitely predicts for historical Babylon eventual extinction of a most permanent sort. Later history saw the literal fulfillment of this prophecy for Babylon was completely deserted by the 7th century AD. Its desolate site has been regarded with superstitious dread by the Arabic speaking population. That's what I was going to get into. The Arabian, verse 20, ever since. Okay, that summarizes um, all of the commentary there. Um, be strong in the Lord, brothers and sisters. Put on the power of his might. We all have much to be thankful for this Thanksgiving Day. We all have so much to be thankful for. And through reading the Holy Word and, and prayer, I, I've come to learn that every time I pray, I do it in a certain order, as I learned in the Word. I first give thanks, I second give praise, and then I pray. And I do it in this order every time because the Bible tells us to do it this way. And I went a long time praying without doing it in that order. I'm not saying there's anything wrong, but I like to do as the Word tells me to do. And when I learned that, it, it changed a lot of my thought process in prayer. Give thanks, give praise, and then pray. And to remember to humble yourself beneath each and every single brother and sister. God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason, so that we might listen twice as much as we speak. And in doing so, we never know who may be placed in front of us and what the Lord may intend to say to us through those people. Be strong in the Lord. Put on the power of His might. God bless and be with each and every one of you this Thanksgiving Day. Peace and grace.